This episode is made possible by NetSuite by Oracle and Brex, the AI-powered spend platform. Hi, this is Amberine Tubasi, CFO of Airtable, and you are listening to the CFO Thought Leaders podcast. This is episode 972. Cologics has grown. We, we've more than doubled EBITDA in the last, call it three years. I, I think we've, we've worked really hard. I think what it's time to do now is to bolster the infrastructure, make sure that we as a team feel good about where we are and invest in, in ourselves as a team. And you're always growing and always growing in some ways, but in some ways it's, it's time to sit back, take stock of what's going well and what's going not and kind of reload for the next, for the next set of adventures. And, and really just as we look at the team, you know, look at like, where, where we're missing, where we need to add. It's always how we can be more efficient, but I, I do think it's a good time to do a little bit of reflection for us. So. Hi, it's Jack. On today's episode, we speak with Rachel Stack, CFO of Cologix. Cologix has grown. We, we've more than doubled EBITDA in the last, call it three years. I, I think We've, we've worked really hard. I think what it's time to do now is to bolster the infrastructure, make sure that we as a team feel good about where we are and invest in, in ourselves as a team. And you're always growing and always growing in some ways, but in some ways it's, it's time to sit back, take stock of what's going well and what's going not and kind of reload for the next, for the next set of adventures. And, and really just as we look at the team, you know, look at like, where, where we're missing, where we need to add. It's always how we can be more efficient, but I, I do think it's a good time to do a little bit of reflection for us. So. 37,025, These are the three numbers to remember to get the visibility and control you need to make the right business decisions instantly. 37,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down expenses. 1. Because your business is one of a kind, you should get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system and with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash KPI. That's netsuite.com slash KPI. Hello, we're speaking with Rachel Stack, CFO of Cologix. Rachel, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. So surprise, Rachel, we're going to ask you to look back as we do with every guest. And we're looking for those experiences that you feel prepared you to become a finance leader. As you look back, what comes to mind? Sure. I mean, first, first piece is, you know, investment banking in general. Um, I was an investment banker for 11 years at RBC. And, and before that, RBC Daniels uh, was, was the predecessor company. Um, I was an investment banker in Denver, which is an odd place to be, but, but really that's a function of um, joining RBC Daniels. RBC, um, well, it was Daniels and Associates when I joined, and it was really a very small um, middle market um, M&A boutique. So our job was to uh, buy and sell or help people buy and sell telecom, cable, and tower companies. And really that's sort of where I cut my teeth. And it was great um, in the sense, not only did I get to you know, work hard and learn a lot, which you know, was uh, you know, always the, the best way to, to fast forward things, but I got to really talk to investors in the sector 
really focused on on one sector. In my in my case, it happened to be data infrastructure and fiber in particular. So um, really got to talk to the most senior people in the industry about what they valued about certain companies, what they liked, what they didn't like, and, and understand really the KPIs that sort of made made them tick and made them interested in a company. And, and so that really helped me uh, learn to value companies and understand sort of you know business dynamics. You also learn um, you know how KPIs, you know key key metrics, make it down to the bottom line and why those matter. So that was super helpful. Um, you know everybody talks about business school, and that was sort of real life business school for me. I, I went to business school obviously, but um, after getting my MBA, got to sit down and just chat with a bunch of investors. And, and I say chat, but don't get me wrong, it was it was hard work, but but a lot of fun. You were out for three years. I know you were working in investment banking, maybe in New York for a, a period. Um, and before you go back for your MBA, am I right about that or clarify it for us? Uh, so I, I actually was, uh, I, I worked at BlackRock Financial Management before they went public. So I was um, one of the first women that they hired to be, um, you know, one of the risk analytic, um, you know, analysts in, in their program. You know, they went public in the late 90s, close to 2000. I was there from 97 to, you know, right about 99 and then went back to business school shortly, shortly thereafter. So spent... Most of my time, ironically, um, you know, monitoring mortgage portfolios and really um, working on a new system called, uh, it, it was called risk attribution and helping them develop that. It was a very early system and they've gone way past that by now, but that was a great experience as well. Yeah. And you mentioned RBC to us. You were there quite a while, yeah. uh, but when you arrive is interesting too. I, I mean, the financial crisis, that period sort yeah. of when you must have just been joining them. Can, can you share with us any of your thinking at that time? Like, wow, I, maybe I chose the wrong path or where, where are we headed here? It's funny. When I, when I went to business school, the one thing I didn't want to be was, was an investment banker, right? And so, um, you know, the, I went to business school from 2001 to 2003 in New York City. And I, I definitely remember uh, during my orientation, one of the deans said, no matter what, you know, we just went through the, the dot-com bubble, no matter what, it'll be, you know, pretty sure it'll be better for you than it will be for them. And, you know, a month later, obviously, um, 9-11 happened and it, it wasn't better. So, um, you know, really kind of thought through what I wanted to do. I actually went back to my hometown of St. Louis, um, did some, you know, did, you know, did some soul searching, was in the process of getting ready to move back to uh, New York, but happened to meet my husband. He lived in Wyoming. Um, and, and so, you know, I moved to, I moved to Denver. And so the, the job available to me, everybody says it's really hard to move to Denver was investment banking. And so that's really how I got stuck in. So I was never, I wouldn't say I was passionate about, um, investment banking. What I was passionate when I got there was telling the story, you know, finding value. I was that the transactions were a challenge. All of that was a challenge. Um, I got married in 2006 and I, I tell this because on my honeymoon, they actually announced that RBC was buying Daniels and Associates. So, <laughs> um, that was, you know, I, I was, I was newly married. It was, you know, 2006, 2007, uh, financial crisis happened in 2008. And, and, um, you know, frankly, I had my first kid in October of 2008. So, I didn't do a lot of thinking about where I wanted to be. It was a, a job, a great family. And, and it really yeah. was, uh, they, they stuck with me. And, um, you know, again, it, it all worked out on the other end. <laughs> when you looked forward, I mean, were you thinking uh, possibly, I, it looks like you wanted to get the operations side. You move into corporate development uh, yeah. as you step out of banking. Is that right? Yeah. So um, stepped out of stepped out of banking was really looking to, um, you know, the companies I knew I spent, um, 10 years covering fiber companies, really, I helped Zayo with their IPO. And, and that's really where I went to right after that. So I helped Zayo with their IPO. Um, so knew the CFO there, knew him well, knew the company, knew I liked them. Um, and, and I was just looking for something different. I, I was tired of being on the on the road. I think one of the things that people um, don't necessarily think about it, you know, when they think about being an investment banker is as you get to the senior levels, it becomes much more of a sales job, right? And, and I you know, took a look in the mirror, knew I wasn't, that wasn't necessarily really where I, uh, where my strong points lay. So I I sort of looked at the other opportunities, Uh, knew the CFO, as I said, had a conversation with him. He said, you know, listen, he he approached me, he said, I'm looking for somebody junior. Um, You know, if you know, you know, anybody who, you know, that might be interested in taking on 
you know, a, a junior corp dev role, let me know. And I said, well, I don't know anybody junior, but I'm looking to make the change. It happened to work out well. Uh, the person who I replaced, um, Scott Reardon, who's, you know, definitely an icon in the space as well, was looking to sort of move on from his role at Zayo. So I joined, got super lucky. I, I got to do um, corporate development and treasury. So essentially a, a buy side version of what I was, was doing. So instead of, um, you know, selling it, I was the client. So super fortunate in, in that and super fortunate in, in the move, for sure. When is the CFO role sort of on your radar? Is it something that you want to aspire to or are you thinking differently? I mean, corporate development roles could have taken you in any one of a number of directions. So one of the great things about Zayo is I got the opportunity to do a huge variety of things, right? So I, I wore a lot of different hats. I was there for seven months. We actually made, um, we, we bought a company called Electric Lightwave, the, the company's second large ac acquisition um, in November. You know, we, we signed in November 16, closed in early 2017. Uh, and, and really the first thing that happened after that is we reorganized the company and they made me the CFO of, of the fiber solutions business. Right. And so that was really that, that was, you know, six months after being an investment banker, that was really hard. Um, it was really hard to figure that piece out. It was, you know, one of the places where I, I think that you learn, you know, as much about what doesn't go well, you know, from from things that do go well. Right. And so they, they dropped me in. I had, you know, six weeks to come up with the model, financial projections, all of that good stuff um, before earnings. Um, you know, we did it. It was it was tough. It was hard. Um, I wouldn't say that um, it was the, the best six months of my life. So continued, you know, but, but I learned a lot. Right. And so I continued in that role probably for another six months and then they moved me back to Corp Dev. But after after having that, you know, running an organization, doing, um, you know, understanding the FPNA, understanding the larger picture, I say that sort that that really, you know, kind of scratched, you know, exposed something that I wanted to do for sure. So, you know, how are you building your CFO skill set at this point? Because we know you're headed to the CFO office. So, you know, honestly, again, one of the better things about Zayo is they, they sort of threw you into everything. It was it was the culture that the founder, Dan Caruso, he's a CEO, was that was very much his culture. Um, you know, he very much um, into, you know, we're all into value creation, but he was very creative in how he did it and was very, you know, numbers, metrics oriented, right? So, I, I at this point sat sort of right next to the the CFO. I was his right hand, so I got to see a lot of a lot of things. If there was a project that needed to be done, I would do it. I ran ESG for a short time. I actually did revenue strategy for for a short time. I sat right next to the investor relations guy for for a short time, and and really you know did the the debt marketing and and all of that good stuff with him. So I got a little taste of investor relations. Um, you know had a you know understood accounting. Um, and, and, you know, I'd say it, it, as you go through and do M&A and the integration, you you do get an understanding of, of um, you know, accounting and tax, but I wouldn't say I spent a ton of time there. Um, you know, I, I'd say that really, you know, the broadest exposure I got, you know, ironically was the, the sale of Zayo to Digital Bridge and to EQT, uh, the take private that uh, was signed in 2019 and closed in 2020. So that was that was an entire adventure on its own. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. <laughs> and and of course, we know that in a short t order, you step into the CFO role at Cologix after that, I believe. Yep. Uh, but uh, and we always like to before we ask you about Cologix about the company. Um, just curious, was was there a recruiter involved, or was it uh, networking that put you in touch, or how? Again, it was it was networking. Um, one of my good friends at, at the time, and she was an investment banker at the time, and she's now uh, the the CFO of Switch, uh, Madonna Park. Uh, you know, came to me and said, "Listen, you know, I know you're, I know you like it, but." Cologix is looking for a CFO. They're in Denver, you know, similar, uh, similar industry. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, let's go. Right. So, you know, how do you, how do you turn that down? It was a, you know, Zayo was 14 billion when we sold it. Um, Cologix is, you know, smaller than that was, you know, we've grown it since then, but, you know, smaller than that at the time. So it was a simpler business model um, and was super fortunate to, to that Madonna made that connection. Um, I knew this, I knew the sponsors at Stone Peak. So that was, Great. I uh, didn't know the management team, but, um, you know, obviously get, get along with them very well. So, um, OK, well, we might have a few more career related questions for you. But right now, let's find out about Cologix. Tell us about this company. What does it do? What are its offerings? 
Sure. So Cologix is a data center company. We are a very connectivity focused data center company focused in North America. Uh, we are in 11 markets in the U.S. and Canada um, in, in you know, primarily tier two markets, although, you know, Canadians that from, from a Canada perspective, we are in the three major markets in Canada. So Toronto, uh, Montreal and Vancouver. We have, um, you know, we, we thrive, frankly, because, our, you know, we have ecosystems in our uh, data centers. So, you know, a lot of our data centers uh, have what they call meet me rooms, which are where networks connect. And so we really do thrive in, in creating, you know, networks and ecosystems among us. We have, you know, 30 cloud on ramps, which is the most of any private provider in, in the U.S. and North America. So, you know, there, there are other larger public companies who may have more, uh, but but from, you know, a small but mighty perspective, we sort of we sort of fit that bill. So, you know, from there, that, that's our digital edge platform, really, the, the cloud on ramps and, and connecting customers and developing those ecosystems. We more recently uh, have started to develop what we call our scale logics uh, platform, which are very, you know, larger larger facilities, you know, up to, you know, call it, you know, 80, 90 megawatts in, in some in some markets. So they are tethered to our digital edge facilities in almost all cases. And it really enables our larger customers, you know, whether they be for, you know, hyperscalers, whether they be people who have like, like large deployments, people who need more latency sensitive uh, workloads that, that aren't just, you know, power, but, but really need connectivity. We allow them to, you know, we enable them to put them, you know, close to the internet so they can connect well. We have facilities like that in uh, Ashburn, in Montreal and Columbus, and we're always looking for more opportunities. So interestingly, you arrive in July of 2020, sort of mm -hmm. the pandemic is really <laughs> yep. uh, closed in on the, on the country. Uh, it was an interesting time. There was a lot of uh, CFOs who stepped into new roles that year. I don't have survey data, but I just know yeah. from doing this podcast, that's the truth. Yep. Um, at the same time, what are you, uh, when you step into the role, do you reorganize finance? What What are you exactly up to in your first chapter there? So I, I was super, super fortunate um, in that I got a, a, a good team with a, a good skill set and it was, you know, well organized. My, my I, I, I frankly just have different skill sets than than my predecessors right so i was brought in you know the the sponsor at the time knew that um, you know my expertise was in you know i had spent a bunch of time at, at zeo like working on debt capital markets um, and doing m a so they knew that that was my um, that was my skill set the the my predecessors before had a slightly different skill set you know operational organizational uh, accounting and, and so i found all of that in really great in really great form. What I did was I sort of developed the muscle around, you know, being aggressive on on debt, you know, on our debt capitalization and and looking at securitization and doing things like that and, and sort of moving to the cutting edge and making us more relevant uh, from from a, a capital markets perspective. I spent a bunch of time doing that. The sponsors, they'd been in for three years, so sort of knew that they wanted to exit in the coming years. And, you know, honestly, as a, as a former investment banker was well positioned to set us up for that. So I spent a lot of time developing those muscles as well, but from, you know, a, a tax perspective, from an accounting perspective, from, you know, th those sorts of perspectives, we're in great shape. I'd say the other piece that we developed along the way is, is FP&A. So again, it, it's, you know, it, if you're telling the, you know, if, if you're moving into more of a strategic um, landscape, you want FP&A to be able to predict, be able to, you know, have a model that works for investors and, and can really sort of predict the future, right? And and that was uh, something that we, you know, emphasized when when I got here. So. When you when you say emphasize, did that mean uh, were there additional hires made? Were there new systems or tools adopted, or what? What exactly when you when you thought we've got to take it to the next level? What are you doing? A, a little bit of both, right? So the finance team, I think, a lot of places, and especially Cologix, runs lean. Um, so, but we did we we did add you know one or two folks. We we certainly added um, you know some utility players on the team who could do a little bit of M and A, but who could also do FP and A and could help us you know with some treasury work as well, right? So we added one or two folks like that. We we definitely upgraded some of the systems. We moved into you know we we had started using a system called Adaptive. We sort of expanded. You know what we used adaptive for, and and how the data went went through there. We we did a lot of work with our revenue team to understand and improve how we you know 
use customer data. That was the other piece, um, you know, not necessarily, you know, it, in my org, one of the things, but, but you know, obviously relevant. So we, we help. One of the things I learned at Zeo was even if you don't control things, you know, if you're a corp dev, you know, my, my corp dev team was strong, it was small, but we had our hands in the pot of everything else because you're sort of the glue that, that holds things together, right? So you may not have a direct influence, but you can have a, a pretty strong say in, in uh, the world. So. And you're saying that related to the customer data. Customer data, yeah, a, a lot of things that, that you know, at most companies don't necessarily. The CFO doesn't need to have a um, a broad direct mandate to have a broad impact, right? So mm-hmm. it's it's really just you know you can influence. Um, you know, you're always a seat at the table, and so having the seat at the table and and using that knowledge, your financial knowledge, whether it be in systems or something else, can really help drive change and improvement throughout the org. And that's one of the things that, you know, I work hand in hand with the revenue organization to make sure that we have always improving, uh, you know, customer understanding of our customers. Was there, and, and this is what we, we always refer to as lines of sight. And we're wondering whether you believe there was a certain metric or number, and maybe it was customer related that needed to be shared more broadly or uh, shared more frequently. And it might not be related to customer. It could be some other area. But we're wondering if there's a a metric that raised the profile of a certain business dynamic that you really felt needed to get eyes on it more regularly. Anything? Yeah, I mean, there's a few. So first, I think that financial literacy is important throughout the organization, right? So, you know, honestly, I'll get on all hands or all hands calls and do, you know, once a year and talk, do a teach in and talk through how, you know, the, the, com- the customer you sell makes it to EBITDA and then we finance it, right? So I do, you know, workshops like that along the way to, to improve customer literacy and make sure that people understand really why, you know, I'm not just saying, you know, we're, the finance team isn't just saying things to say things like it actually matters and it helps drive the business. So that that's one piece of it. There's another piece in particular, we have, um, you know, smallish part of our revenue stream, it's, it's call it 20% of our revenue that, um, you know, we, we always take a look at it always grows nicely. And it's always, you know, just doing okay, right? It, it, it does well. And it, it certainly is a a measure of our ecosystem strength in in our data centers, but you know, again, we decide how much uh, attention and love to to give it, and and you know, was having a conversation with some folks, and and we're debating resources, right? And I said, well, you know, all of that drops down to the bottom line because it's it's a very very high margin product. So I'm like, I would put as much resources again against that as you could, and it, that was just one of those things where something that was you know super simple and and you know straightforward to me. Um, you know, again, financial literacy, it, it just helped drive the conversation and help drive additional resources to that, to that, to that product set, right? It's, it's called interconnection. It's how customers connect from one to other, one, one, you know, uh, to one another in, in data centers, but, you know, really just having that conversation and explaining how things work really drove a change in behavior, I'd say. Now, your, your FP&A people, are they sitting in on meetings with, I imagine you have a customer success team or what have you. How does yours operate in terms of, you know, getting your FP&A brains in the room with with the data? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we are very involved in understanding when customers are going to um, install, when they're going to churn, you know, all of those all of those things. So the FP&A certainly sees the same data. We they report out on it. You know our customer data. You know our, our FP&A team also provides our reports to our investor relations. Sorry, to our um, investors. So they serve as a little bit of investor relations. So they they see it. But more than that, I encourage them to be active in it. So you know why is it why why did this customer install faster than this customer? Is there anything that we can do to to speed that up and really you know use that information to help. You know, not only the customer success team, but but the operations team who's who's installing it, right? So if we can get, um, you know, learnings from the data and, and you know the analysis, I like to pass that on. Like, like you know, we're never um, we don't create the data; we just read the data and and we all talk about it. So, what what, what about M and A? And and uh, forgive us, uh, you know, as the company completed acquisitions on your tour of duty to date, and whether it's likely in the coming year. Yeah, so we've we've completed several acquisitions um, over the last couple of years. Um, when I when I joined, we were in the process of buying, um, you know, 
what we call min four. We were buying a, a uh, property from uh, another data center company. We since brought one in uh, Silicon Valley. We entered Silicon Valley as our 11th market. So we bought that there. Um, we also, uh, you know, just purchased two assets, one in Montreal and one in Vancouver from, you know, a, a company called Sixtera. But the most, you know, I'd say that the broadest M&A that we've done is, is obviously the recap of our, of our equity investors, right? So we sold um, in 2022, <laughs> I'm losing track of the year, 2022, we, we completed uh, our equity and our debt recap. So we both uh, traded out our equity investors and we're now in what they call an asset continuation vehicle, as well as uh, moved our debt from, you know, term loans to securitizations. Tell us something about your finance team. I mean, you, you obviously have this corporate development group, I would think. And are they do they operate separately from the rest of finance, or uh, are there opportunities for you know FP and A people looking to get M and A smarts to jump over and uh, sure. assist, or what can you do? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my my team is essentially organized in two houses. So the first side is the accounting side, and I find that the, the, the accounting, which has billing, tax, and all of that, I have a chief accounting officer who does a great job. But but those people's, you know, what they and they, they also work in financial systems. So th- those people have you know more defined roles. The other side of the house, which is the smaller side of the house, there's probably you know six of us, and candidly, I spend more time over over there. Um, is is the M and A corp dev? You know, it's a corp dev integration. Um, you know, treasury capital market side and, and FPNA, right? So those so those people are much more utility players. They're you know sporks as you will, right? So so they're more uh, they, they can do more more things. They get more experience. I have you know a couple of you know very young young folks like in their you know early 20s, a couple of years out of school who just, you know, they're, they're just really smart. So they do a lot of modeling, whether it's for M&A or for, um, you know, FP&A, what, what have you. I have an FP&A leader who spends most of his time on, you know, FP&A, but does get involved when it comes to, um, you know, integration and the like. So I, I'd say that, um, you know, over on that side of the house, there's a lot more ability to, to sort of, you know, move, move around. Um, the accounting side does get involved when it comes to integration and, and all of that fun stuff. But, you know, as it, as it relates to looking at deals, there's a lot more flexibility on, on the corp dev side of the house. Curious, since you arrived, uh, particularly in the last year, we would imagine that AI has been a topic of conversation, perhaps at every level. Um, but for your finance people and and uh, AI, what is it? What, what's the conversation that they're having? Uh, and is it is it a tool for FPNA? Is it something much more? What what are you, what are you learning? So first, I mean, AI workloads are a huge uh, opportunity for us customer base. Like, uh, if if you think about you know where AI you know workloads need to live, a lot of them need to live you know in a data center. Whether it's right right now, it's space and power, but as we move forward, it will be you know more connected. Um, you know, lower latency model. So first of all, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, not just the finance team, but the entire organization thinking about how customers are moving, you know, towards that and, and how you want that to, to look, right? And then as we, um, you know, think about AI customers, right? You know, there's AI workloads and then there's like customers who are focused only on, on AI, right? That's obviously a lot of credit work, credit worthiness, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we do a lot of work around, around that. Um, and then, you know, and then on the, uh, on the other side, right, my, you know, my, my AP teams, my, you know, all of those to you, know, everybody, frankly, does a lot of work around phishing, et cetera, and how AI impacts that. But as it relates to systems, you know, I'd say we're, we're in early days. Um, we have a fairly, you know, simple, um, our, our business is fairly simple. I, I think that there's work that we're looking into, you know, for AI and, and how AI can help us as we move into next year. I think I'm excited about some of those efficiencies. A, a little wary, right? It, it's one of those things you don't need to be the first to jump in, but it, at some point, you know, you, you, you do need to, you know, we're, we're sticking our toe in the water and kind of seeing seeing the temperature and kind of picking our initial places where we think it can help us most. Is this uh, company interested in the market? Does it have an IPO in its future or perhaps not right away? 
I'd say not not necessarily right right away. As we think about our business and we think about you know our investors, right? They they just the new ones just joined us, um, you know, two years ago. We're putting a bunch of capital to work right now. I, I'd say we're you know just like most data data center companies, we're building, we're growing. I'd say um, if you look at the data, so so I'd say that our investors are happy with you know how we are and how you know our, our current capital. You know, you never know what happens in five ten years, but. For, for now, I think we're, we're happy. Um, the more recent trend actually for data center companies is to go private. So you've seen, you've seen a lot over the last few years, be, whether it be, you know, QTS, Switch, you know, any number of folks who have, you know, Cyrus One who've moved to, you know, are now owned by large, you know, infrastructure funds. So I think, I, I think that's been the more recent trend. Um, we'll see as these get older or as these get, you know, larger and, and bigger and they get kind of longer in into the investment cycle, what the investors decide to do. But for now, um, we're still on the, you know, call it mid to small end of mid to small end of those. So plenty of opportunities to stay private. Well, we're up to what we refer to as our finance strategic moment. And this is where we just ask uh, our guests to share one moment of strategic insight they've had over their long careers. Um, anything come to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Sure. I mean, there's a, there's a couple. There's I think we've talked about a few places where, um, you know, really the finance team impacts the business overall. But it, as I think about, you know, just one big um, strategic moment, um, it has to be the, the take private of, of Zao, right? So in, in thinking about that, it, we you know, just how it how it started. Uh, we were looking at, at other, in, you know, opportunities that there was a lot of discussion amongst the board. Do we split into two? Do we do, you know, how, how do we move forward? Um, we had two separate um, businesses that, that had kind of different dynamics. We had one that grew more quickly and looked a lot more like a data center business. We had another that looked a little bit more like a services business. So we thought about splitting those into, you know, Fiber Co. and, and, and you know, in Enterprise Co., um, and, and we actually made that public announcement. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not lost on people that, you know, obviously the, the stock the next day, um, let's be honest, it, it didn't do well. It was down, I want to say 20%. So got a pretty clear message from, from the market that they didn't, you know, necessarily think that that was the way forward for, for Zayo. From that, frankly, we were approached by a number of different, uh, you know, opportunities. Uh, you know, we had a number of different, you know, potential acquirers. We had um, one consortium and one, you know, it, it, one consortium that was very interested. We went through the, um, you know, we, we went through the diligence process with them, you know, did all of that kind of got, got to the very end. And at the end of the day, um, another person appeared and that was digital, digital bridge and, and EQT and sort of worked closely with them, developed relationships, you know, just as the other, you know, as you go through MA, you sort of play one party off the other. That's sort of just what you do. Um, and, and really they, they ended up being the winner. So went through a kind of a detailed diligence process with them, you know, really, 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 you know, um, very detailed people talk about how public company M and A is very high level. This was not that there, there was a lot of work done, uh, throughout. So, um, spent, you know, months with them, four day diligence session in a hotel, you know, locked in a room. Everybody tells that story that definitely happened. Um, you know, and, and finally went, um, went, went, you know, announced to take private in May of 2019 time, time flies may of may of 2019 and, uh, closed it in March of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I'd say, you know, some of the lessons learned there, right. Were you know, you always keep your options open. You always look at various different, um, you know, opportunities to do various things. You, you know, it's, it, that, that was certainly one of them. Um, another one, right, it's always important um, as a finance person and as a person, this is something I learned as an investment banker and something that's carried me through. It's always important to be straightforward and honest, right? So you can, you know, you can always, you know, information is what it is and people are going to ask the questions. But, you know, as long as you're straightforward and honest, the only thing I take forward with me is, you know, my, my credibility um, through 20 years of, of, you know, work. It's, it's the only people, you know, people see me and they, they know that they're likely getting the straight scoop, the straight story, you know, what have you. So that was, um, you know, probably a couple of the, the big moments from a finance perspective. You know, it's, um, it was an interesting tale. If you read the proxy, I think the proxy goes to party Q. So there was, it, it's not just those two, but there were a number of other folks involved. And um, it really was 
a very interesting tale, very, you know, had a great, you know, learned a lot from the investment bankers there as well on, on how to take something private and how boards look at things and, and all in all it like, you know, strategic moment, um, you know, how do you like strategic moment, learning moment for my career, for sure. For sure. CFOs and controllers, does expense management feel like a necessary evil? It's time to switch to Brex. Brex automates and accelerates spend management with easy to use corporate cards, travel, expense management, and bill pay all on one AI powered platform. Brex makes it easy to boost efficiency and compliance enterprise wide and free up your managers, employees, and counting team for higher impact work. Top companies from startups to enterprises are using Brex to automate manual work and transform their finance operations. We're talking DoorDash, Robinhood, Airtable, and countless other industry leaders. Ready to join them? Switch to AI-powered spend management at Brex.com. We want to begin by asking you to look back again, and we're wondering about that first 30 to 60 days, and you shared a little bit with us about your arrival there at uh, Cologix. Uh, what uh, would you tell, if you could go back in time and just give yourself a, you know, a slip of paper with a few notes on it, what would it be? Something that, you know, you just wish someone had told you as you stepped into that. Yeah. So I was happy that, you know, one of the things that I I think I I did right and I always recommend to everybody else is, you know, listen, you know, honestly, there's, unless, unless something is on fire, there's nothing that can't wait, you know, 15 to 30 days. So, so listen, talk to people, find out what's going wrong, find out what's going right. Always get a variety of opinions because everybody comes, you know, with, with an agenda for sure. Um, That said, I would say, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, 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 mentioned how I came in and Stone Peak was, you know, focused on on a few things. I think one of the things that I wish, and I, I give this advice to people, you know, looking to make similar moves as I did, it really is the small stuff that matters, right? And it's, it's you know, I, I, I have confidence in my chief accounting officer. I've counted, you know, confidence in how he does all of that. But really, it is, it, it's easy to get lost in the, the flash of the M&A and the flash of the court, you know, the, the flash of the debt and all of that. But like, at the end of the day, the, the majority of the company's energy is focused on getting bills out, making sure that we pay taxes, making sure that but like the financials run, getting make sure that audits like the finance organization, the majority of the energy is focused there. Right. And so I think that you have to you don't have to be an expert in any of those things and you don't have to know any of those things, but you have to learn what people are doing. Right. And you have to learn, you know, and, and really develop an appreciation for how all of that gets done, because without all of that, you know, forget M and A. You know, like like a lot of other stuff wouldn't be possible. So I, I'd say that that's probably you know the big the, the big piece of advice that I give anybody in my um, who is coming in from my my perspective. It's it's probably a little different than folks who came in as accountants, <laughs> but like I, it's it's um you know honestly these people spend their life you know and 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 their livelihoods and, and things like that you know trying to get accounts right, trying to get all of these things, right? To, to learn and be a leader of these people, appreciating that's probably the most important piece. Right. Rachel, we always like to ask our guests to reflect a little on the personal side for us. Uh, in general, is there something most people don't know about you? <laughs> so most, most people think I'm a fairly hard charging person and I am, I was, you know, like, like if people are, you know, just like, Oh, I play a bunch of sports. I look like I was a D one swimmer, all that good stuff. But like, honestly, if I have time at the end of the day and I'm, I'm not a big I'm not a big reader. I, I, I wish that's always on my list of possible New Year's resolutions. Never quite makes the cut. But um, honestly, like I like to go in the kitchen and, and lately I've been baking. I've been doing, you know, making bread, doing things like that. So really, if I'm not hanging out with my kids or, you know, mom duties or, you know, working out like like I, I'm happiest just hanging out in the kitchen, trying new things. I, I don't ever really make dinner. But if it comes to crazy things like make bread or make this, you know, crazy thing you saw on TV, I'll try it. So <laughs> I, I think you mentioned you're, you're originally from St. Louis. Is that right? Or, That's um, correct. That's yeah. Correct. And you, you had a stint in New York and Denver. <laughs> what, what uh, geography, any, any, what, what do you consider home these days? 
Denver, I mean, Denver is where my, my kids are, were born. So I have to, I have to go with Denver. I miss New York uh, a ton. I, you know, really, if I get a chance to go for a weekend, I'll go for a weekend. Um, you know, St. Louis is always, always has a place in my heart. You know, again, you know, where, where you went to high school, just, you know, really, you know, I went to a smallish high school, so we always, you know, it's always going to be home. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, we wonder if you have a book recommendation for us. Doesn't have to be a business book. Maybe it's something that's helpful or handy or you escape with. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I were more of a reader. And honestly, I, I listen to, I, I do listen to podcasts. I, I'm like, I'm like a, you know, oddly fascinated by, by British history. So I spend most of my time over there, but I mean, in terms of, you know, work, you know, work related things, I, I really just read the news. I, I sort of keep up on that, whether it be Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Barron's, et cetera. Like it's just getting a variety of, of information, but in terms of, you know, I, I'm not, I wish I were more of a reader, but you know, podcasts, I tend to go more towards the, um, history. <laughs> Are you, uh, did you, uh, were you a, cr- a fan of the crown on Netflix? Is that I, my, that we just finished it last night. So I, I don't want to have any spoilers, but it was amazing and I'm sad to be finished. So <laughs> yeah, no, I thought, I thought, uh, they ended it very well. They did. Um, they did. You have to love the queen at the end, I guess. But, <laughs> um, we're up to our final question, which is where we're going to ask you to look forward. Finally, and what we want to know is your priorities as a CFO uh, for 2024. Now that we're at the start, I can just say 2024 or the next 12 months. What would those be? Ecologics has grown. We, we've more than doubled EBITDA in the last, call it three years. I, I think we've, we've worked really hard. I think what it's time to do now is to bolster the infrastructure, make sure that we as a team feel good about where we are and invest in in ourselves as a team. And you're always growing and always growing in some ways, but in some ways it's it's time to sit back, take stock of what's going well and what's going not and kind of reload for the next for the next set of adventures. And and really just as we look at the team, you know, look at like where where we're missing, where we need to add. It's always how we can be more efficient. But I, I do think it's a good time to do a little bit of reflection for us. So. Rachel Stack, thank you for joining us on CFO Alt Leader. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. We hope 2024 is treating you well. If you haven't already, we hope you'll pay a visit to CFOThoughtLeader.com and go ahead and subscribe to our Mentoring Round newsletter, where we highlight the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our recent CFO guests. Also, LinkedIn users, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.